and welcome to Confused Reviews, where a cartoon drawing reviews movies, and life can get pretty tough. Now I know, that was quite a depressing way to start an episode, but if you've been alive for more than about 20 seconds, you know that's just par for the course. Thankfully, adversity not only makes the mind stronger, but does lead to great stories and quality movies about the struggle. However, one of my favorite genres that delves deep into the strange window of time where you're not quite a helpless kid anymore and still not a soulless cog in the capitalist machine is that of the teenage coming-of-age flick. This particular type of film has a very universal appeal, because you're either on track to experience this pocket of existence, have already suffered through it and are hopefully onto greener pastures, or you're dead. There doesn't seem to be much in between. And while even to this day, great stories are still being made regarding growing up, I think most will agree that the 1980s were the genre's golden age. Every week seemingly gave life to a new adventure. Some good, some great, and some... You know. But narrowing it down a tad, there exists but a handful of movies that I feel not only did the concept well, but changed the game entirely. And nowhere else is that exemplified than 1986's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Before we go a single second further, it wouldn't be right to not establish the man, the myth, the linguistic genius that is John Hughes. While his name might not ring too many school attendance bells to the layman, there's a 150% chance you know his work. With a resume containing more classics than most people in Hollywood would craft in 10 lifetimes, this lovable, mulleted madman is the mind behind some of the best movies, characters, and screenplays of all time. And by the time 1986 rolled around, he had already written and or directed 16 Candles, Weird Science, Pretty in Pink, The Breakfast Club, and both initial vacation movies. Not only that, but Ferris Bueller's a script was allegedly written in less than a week. Now that the story was off the ground and the movie was officially greenlit, the casting of the titular hero began. John Cryer, James Spader, Nick Cage, George Clooney, Kiefer Sutherland, Rob Lowe, Eric Stoltz, John Cusack, Jim Carrey, Johnny Depp, Tom Cruise, Robert Downey Jr., and Michael J. Fox were all considered for the role of Ferris Bueller. One take. <laughs> Thankfully, Hughes wrote the part with Broderick in mind, and it all ended up working out. The role of Sloan Peterson was up for grabs by the red-headed 80s icon Molly Ringwald, and reportedly Emilio Estevez turned down the role of Cameron Fry, as well as numerous others who were attached at certain points. But Alan Ruck, who had auditioned for Bender in The Breakfast Club, Sushi, eventually landed the Red Wings' loving renegade. Telling the story of one lovable and charismatic teenager who ditches class to have the best day ever with his girlfriend and best friend, and they get into all kinds of mischief along the way. It also follows the school principal committed to stopping the truancy. But you already knew all that, didn't you? So call yourself into work or school, borrow your dad's unprotected and massively expensive sports car, and let's take a close look at how leisure rules. This is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Our tale begins with a scam as old as time. Ferris Bueller, played by Matthew Broderick, is attempting to fool his parents, played by Cindy Pickett and Linman Ward. Interestingly, these two actually got married for real after this movie. It didn't last very long, but hey, at least they had legit chemistry. Speaking of getting it on off screen, we also see Ferris's sister, played by Jennifer Grey. Yep, along with the parents getting together, Broderick and Grey got into a relationship during shooting as well. Not sure how awkward that must have been, considering they play siblings, but that wouldn't be the first or last time that happened. Looking at you, Eric Stoltz. And then things were difficult on the set. Eric was, it was, uh, it was not easy. Uh, he was doing the, a very methody thing. You know, everybody call me Marty. Okay. Except Leah, who's playing my mom, who I'm trying to make out with. Anyways, after some mental gymnastics, he fakes out the parents with ease, and he's free to begin breaking the fourth wall. They bought it. Now, for anyone not too savvy with film terminology, allow me to briefly explain the fourth wall. Breaking the fourth wall refers to the idea of directly acknowledging the audience during a movie or TV show. The name stems from when box sets became mainstream, having three walls comprise the set, with the fourth side being the link between the performers and the people watching. It began in the 16th century, has been used since the silent film era, as well as who knows how far back, and has been crafting cinematic comedy way before Deadpool ever did it. Oh, hello. From Mel Brooks using it in some of the funniest ways imaginable. What the hell am I looking at? When does this happen in the movie? Now. Two TV shows having their whole gimmick surround it to every single possibility in between. In the industry, we call them cigarette burns. 
speaking directly to the viewer is a tough task to get right, and can be used as the stage equivalent to an aside, informing whatever the filmmaker needs to get into the audience's head, even if it doesn't always make sense. I suggest you don't worry about this sort of thing and just enjoy yourself. That goes for you all, too. But I believe Ferris Bueller uses the method better than any other. Not only does it make the character a lot more personable, but catches everyone up to speed in minutes. Ferris is skipping school, has been sick nine times this semester, is lying to his parents and faculty, and plans to have a kick-ass day. Okay, let's keep it moving. He runs through the successful formula to being able to ditch class, albeit it might be missing a few tips, including watching this movie, ironically enough. It's a little childish and stupid, but then so is high school. Ferris Bueller would totally be a fucking YouTube vlogger if this movie were to be remade. Don't remake it. I tried watching Expelled, which is basically Ferris Bueller light, and it made me die inside. Pushing forward, he continues to get ready, including a junk washing shower. And if you've seen this movie and never once tried spiking your hair like that, you're a fucking liar. I quote John Lennon. Well, I quote Yoko. Hey, shut up! Shut the fuck up! You fucking retard! After all, he was the walrus. It's like Lennon said. You look for the person who will benefit and, uh, uh, you know... Uh, I am the walrus. And at a whopping six minutes in, we hear the single biggest line of dialogue. One so famous, so world-renowned, that this string of syllables might be known by every single person on Earth. Maybe. Bueller? Who? Bueller? Never heard of him. The teacher, Bueller, played by Ben Stein, was both a former lawyer and speechwriter for Nixon. Now, aside from learning that tricky dick fact, Well, I'm not a crook is that he's probably most fondly remembered for win Ben Stein's money, or how we all wear masks, metaphorically speaking. We all wear masks, metaphorically speaking. And don't even get me started on some of his more <clears throat> cerebral roles. Bouncing away from the school, we meet arguably the real protagonist of the story, Cameron Fry, played by Alan Ruck. He's coincidentally also sick. <coughs> so Ferris calls up his best pal and tries weaseling him out of bed too. Let my Cameron now, along with the obvious branding aspects of asking questions about a movie, another thing I love to dive into is theories surrounding them. And since Ferris Bueller's Day Off is most likely the biggest film I've ever covered, as it seems everyone and their mother, your mother, is aware of Mr. Bueller's 1986 adventure, time to throw on the tinfoil and put this beloved 35-year-old Library of Congress inducted epic under the microscope on my level. Welcome to the first of many confused conspiracies. Cameron was actually sick, and the whole movie is a dream. Now, this one has been said about both of our leads, but we'll get back to the F-man at the end. Regarding French Fry, it's pretty simple. He was legitimately sick, and in a loopy, hallucinating state he merely imagined the whole day. I don't buy this one at all, but it goes way deeper, and ends up morphing into a much bigger theory. Ferris isn't real. Fairy dust. It doesn't exist. It's never landed. It is no matter. Ferris Durden, if you will, is a fleshed out concept that explains the events of this movie is, again, all in Cameron Fry's head, and Ferris Bueller is the confident angel on his shoulders he wishes he was. One example is in this very scene, where Bueller somehow knows exactly what his buddy said after they got off the phone with extreme timing and accuracy. Plus, our soon-to-be-introduced love interest is seen holding hands with Cam in a later scene, implying he might be fantasizing about a girl he likes but doesn't have. He's gonna marry me. <laughs> no. So is it really all in his sheltered skull? I think not. Sure, these minor moments can look super compelling when strung together, but it doesn't explain the focus on Ferris's sister, parents, and basically every other character fawning over him. And we haven't even scratched the surface of beliefs about our title character. Speaking of which, we hop over to his mom's work. Who gets a call from Ferris's principal, Ed Rooney, played by Jeffrey Jones? You might recognize the Dean of Students from Ed Wood, Beetlejuice, or being an actual fucking pedophile. Yep, the guy most famous for his escapades following around a teenager to a borderline criminal degree was convicted of basically the same thing. Life imitating art? Ah, whatever, fuck the fat cunt. So yeah, this power-hungry jackass gives the 411 on Ferris's continual truancy, but just as he's recounting the numbers, it subtracts before his very eyes. 
I asked for a car, I got a computer. Well, the only silver lining here is at least he's just hacking attendance and not, you know, starting World War III with nuclear annihilation that looks like an Atari game. The 80s really made some weird movies. Back with his sis, we see two things. One, the entire school absolutely loves our hero. And two, Genie is one of the most angsty, despicable Debbie Downers in all of cinema. Shut up. But it doesn't stay sour for long, as we see a few freshmen getting goofed on with one of the greatest musical instruments ever. <coughs> a synthesizer in the 80s would have cost $8,000. So remember that. Hi, Ferris, how's your bod? Man, everyone seems to be cool with Ferris Bueller. The sportos, motor hits, geeks, sluts, bloods, wastoids, dweebies, dickheads. Almost makes me wonder. Was Ferris a drug dealer? Wow, that didn't take long before the theories got way out there. While I never advocate using a drug, whatever this definition might apply to, I'm not your fucking dad, figure it out. Figured it out. But I'll actually one-up this idea. Ferris ran a grade hacking operation. It takes all the pieces scrounged up from the micro Tony Montana hypothesis and hopefully adds more to it. Yeah, he's getting me out of summer school. He states that his sister got a car and he was given a computer. Ferris worked his way up the ranks, helping out everyone and anyone to get their grades up. Probably charged a few bucks to do so, and eventually won over the whole freaking school. It also explains away his gadgets and money he throws around during the expensive day off. You know, as long as I've known him, everything works for him. Unless... Okay, a few more. His lack of money. Maybe the fact that his folks are obviously wealthy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I definitely don't live in a house that looks anywhere like this. Maybe they tossed him a few Finskis. See what a Finsky can do to a guy's attitude? Or Cameron, who is seemingly super rich. Maybe Bueller finagled his way into getting some cash from Cam. In a deleted portion of the original script and story, he ends up stealing some savings bonds from his dad. So he either stole, swindled, or does some nefarious shit to create this movie. At this point, I wouldn't be shocked if he was a secret sociopath who grew up to become Patrick Bateman. Nah, not true. I hope. In case you two are getting bored right now, Cameron has a quick hissy fit on whether or not to go out, and we move ahead to see Sloane Peterson, played by Mia Sara. She's scooped up from a boring lecture due to a dead grandmother. Dead grandmother? Yeah, that's the level of bold they're going with. LaRue's covers all their bases, as Rooney doesn't believe it, so just as he's calling Sloane's dad, the very man rings the school. Ah, this is George Peterson. But the principal also thinks the one on the phone is Bueller, so he... I'll tell you what, dipshit. ...acts very unprofessionally, only for the boy wonder to call in as well. Hey, Mr. Rooney, how you doing? Gotcha, bitch! Thankfully for the school, Mr. Peterson, and avoiding a huge lawsuit, it was actually Stevens the whole time. This power move is snowballed into a bigger problem, as before we know it, they agreed for Mr. Peterson to pick up his daughter in person. This creates an obvious situation, and they make the most logical decision to, well again, you know. Clearly this song has forever been bound to this movie and will always be seen as a funny way to showcase something classy. Relax, it's being picked up from the bakery. Damn. And I hate to say this, as it may ruin the song for you forever, but all I can think when I hear this song in any other context than seeing something cool is that it sounds like Darth Vader getting his dick sucked. Sorry. And there's no way I'm the first to notice this, but Ferris is literally dressed like Inspector Gadget, which Matthew Broderick would go on to play. Guess the Matrix is broken. Anyway, no matter what Ninja Turtle disguise he tries using, his wit and carefree nature shines through. What do you think this is all about? You think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life! With their journey now in motion, we fly into the heart of Chicago. And the mix of music and acting blends very well. Again, with the whole life mirroring art, maybe Ferris should keep his hands on the wheel. I mean, hell, they brought him back to do a car commercial in 2012 that people thought was a belated sequel. Jeez. 
Watch out for next week when Ronald McDonald stars in Pumping Iron 2. Since gas isn't free and we can't put too many miles on the Ferrari, they drop off this extremely rare and expensive car at the finest shady parking garage Chicago can provide. Relax. The greasy attendant is Dennis, as confirmed in the novelization of the film, and is portrayed here by Richard Edson. Uh, what country do you think this is? His minor yet memorable role was once offered to Bill Paxton, who turned it down. And as much as it's fun to ponder what that might have looked like, Edson acts the part so well. It also helps that he looks like John Turturro's Jesus from The Big Lebowski is the one who steals the car. No, no. Nobody fucks with the Jesus. There's even a scene later where the Ferrari flies through the air while the main Star Wars theme plays. All of those elements sound like they shouldn't work together, yet they do. It's surreal and kinda hard to explain. That's our boys. The three amigos make a few pit stops and eventually wind up at a fancy restaurant. The head waiter, played by Jonathan Schmock, just can't seem to get out of Chicago. And he's also very hesitant to allow the current clientele into the joint. Even with this well-orchestrated plan of snatching someone else's reservation... Hi, I'm Abe Froman. It doesn't work, and before they are ready to wave the white flag, they completely demolish this smug asshole. Mr. Froman, this is Sergeant Peterson, Chicago Police. Oh! Now, as masterfully as that was executed, it once again pops an idea into my head. Maybe Ferris called in the Abe Froman reservation to make sitting down easier. Now this isn't foolproof, as it is presented as if he just picked out a random party to snag from. However, it makes him seem a lot more sly and innovative if he did end up planning this beforehand. Otherwise, wouldn't the Sausage King come into the restaurant at some point? This place looks really elite and packed, so Ferris and co. either have more luck than a rabbit's foot wrapped in four-leaf clovers and winning lottery tickets, or Abe probably would have come for his French onion soup. While taking a victory leak, we get a very profound statement that makes a ton of the magic from this movie fall into place. I used to think that my family was the only one that had weirdness in it. That one sentence, mostly said while juxtaposed with his salient sister, that's about to go into a drawn-out explanation of the terrible environment Cameron grew up in, is a very important moment in the film that might go in one ear and out the other. When you're a kid, you imagine the quirks and flaws of your family to be unique to you and you only. Nobody has it as hard as you. Then, as you become a full-fledged person yourself, you realize everybody's family's fucking weird. It's good for him. It teaches him to deal with his fear. Like I said at the top of the episode, life is a never-ending battle of struggle, and we would all benefit from having a comrade like Ferris Bueller. Someone to cut through the bullshit and just have fun with what little time we have on this floating dirt ball. Insert generic inspirational music and quote whatever Rocky t-shirt or poster works best. Man, it started getting a little sappy for a second there. Uh, quick, let's debunk another theory. Ferris is trapped in a Groundhog Day situation. This right here is the sunken place of grasping at straws. This concludes that Ferris's unbelievable luck throughout the journey is a result of some unwritten Bill Murray spiritual sequel. This one can be shot down with one single dad-shaped hole. 4,000 restaurants in the downtown area. I picked the one my father goes to. If you're telling me he's been reliving this day as some ultimate adventure with no hiccups, why would he get so close to getting caught so many times? I think this one is the least likely, as the movie does a great job of keeping the rebellious protagonist actually vulnerable, always just on the cusp of failure. It's not even remotely close to any Happy Death Day antics, so throw this one out. Returning to Rooney, he's still hunting, and it's not really going his way. Your ass is mine. Be careful. Turns out he's into that. Your ass is mine. Andy grabs a few stale bar napkins to freshen up. Who's winning? The Bears. The Bears!
At least it's not the weak-ass, short-lived Ferris Bueller sitcom. That had Jennifer Aniston even before that fucking Leprechaun movie. And Rooney continues his endless attempt to find Ferris. Now, those of you with attention spans near that of a goldfish with ADHD, you may wonder why Ed is trying so hard to find this little bastard. But as someone who's been pursued by a certain blubbering burn victim for years, I know as well as anyone how much content can be squeezed from that premise alone. Isn't that right, Fred? Oh, and did you see that in the beginning of the scene? Of course not, because I didn't show you, but here it is. Ever wonder why there appears to be a child's drawing on the Bueller family fridge along with this much larger family in Tom's office? Here it is! Just like you said! That's because, as is notorious for most of John Hughes's creations, this was originally much longer and stuffed with way more ideas. Meaning there is an original cut clocking in at nearly three hours. Deleted material includes... The three on a Chicago boat tour, taking a stroll to the strip club, a bunch of instances of Ferris being a dickhead, him smoking, both for the buzz and the high, Louis Anderson having more than a lineless cameo, the aforementioned siblings, and one bit removed due to tragedy. Originally, Ferris found himself being interviewed at a radio station, informing the public that he was going up into space in a shuttle, as the first teenager in space. Unfortunately, the Challenger rocket blew up, so that was all recalled. The closest thing we have to the recovered deleted material today is one original trailer. Might be time to plant my flag and propose this one. Release the Hughes cut. Hopefully whatever vault those film reels now reside in still exists. Back to the story, they pop into the Art Institute of Chicago and showcase some priceless masterpieces and builds on Cameron's character more than 10,000 lines of dialogue ever could. This is one of the most emotional moments in any movie and comes out of nowhere. It's a brief instance of real life creeping into this otherwise fantastical atmosphere, and shows Cameron's feeling of being trapped as well as having no idea who he really is, which is something extremely relatable to those growing up. I love it. And in one of the coolest bits ever put on screen, Ferris somehow makes his way in the middle of a parade float and vibe checks everyone with one of the catchiest and most recognizable songs. How did Ferris orchestrate a whole parade song and dance number? Two of them, no less. Now, as risky as it was to be on display in front of so many wow. the sheer adrenaline and joy that courses through my veins whenever the scene comes on is almost unmatched. This anonymous commenter sums it up best. This scene captures the pinnacle of existence. Cheesy? Sure. Untrue? No! No! And while I can't play any of the real songs, no matter what version I see fit, it is an impeccable way to bring the whole gang together. Breezing through some plot, Genie gets home, ruins Rooney, he gets a few doubloons worth of parking tickets, is towed away, Genie heads to the police station, and they embark home with the car. Well, that is until Cameron realizes that there might be a few racked up on the odometer. <coughs> oh, and someone ordered Ferris a fucking prostitute. She's forgotten as soon as she appears, but it's super strange. Hey look, there's Louis Anderson again. Anyway, Baby Hausman is thoroughly freaked out, and while at the station, meets Charlie Sheen, who is not only credited as boy in police station, but looks like he's strung out on tiger's blood. Drugs. Also, he's the third actor to find himself in some sick and twisted controversy. But for our pal Chuck, well, that's nothing new. I'm by winning. And reportedly, Bud Fox stayed up for 48 straight hours to prepare for the part. I'm sure there were no third parties helping him achieve that either. But the Sheenster showing up does allow me to highlight a deleted subplot that is hiding in plain sight. See, I set you up a little when I said he had no credited name, because at one point, he did. Garth Volbeck. It was intended for him to have a fully formed character with a backstory and connection to our lead. He was meant to be an old best friend of Bueller, who tried to help the product of a banner year at the old Bender family, eventually dropping out and... winding up here. Garth's family are the ones who are being shown the house by Ferris's mom, and there's the family label on the tow truck that got Rooney. 
And yet with all of that ripped straight out of the finished movie, his small presence is one of the most recalled parts of the movie. Why don't you put your thumb up your butt? And he proved that nobody can keep like a sheen down, you know? They can keep a Estevez down, cause his brother. <laughs> They use the long-standing myth of trying to drive backwards to unwind the miles they unintentionally stacked up, and it turns out to be Cam's final breaking point. I never say anything! Alan Ruck does not get enough credit for his performance. He pours so many years of pent-up aggression into a few seconds. Not bad, kid. Despite this moment of clarity, he pushes it to the limit. <laughs> The setup is so simple, using close-up shots to show the tension building, the cracks beginning to show, and builds to one of the most tragic yet satisfying moments. Once he snaps out of shock, Cameron and Ferris argue over who will take the fall, and thankfully, a fully changed Cameron is ready to stand up to his dad, even if that does mean he'll suffer the same fate as in Freaky. Bet nobody saw that reference coming. <clears throat> With Jeannie picked up and Sloane and Ferris all kissed up, the race home is on. As his sister's bad luck continues and he is able to freely trespass around all kinds of classic upper-class suburban situations. Especially these unproductive sunbathers. This nail-biter of a chase uses music, close calls, and slow motion to blend into the foolproof scene. I've seen this movie dozens of times, and no matter how many stupid pizza parodies they make of this scene, I always hold my breath when he makes that last jump. So with Ferris back home, the most unlikely team-up since all those other times, Jeannie actually saves her bro and allows Rooney's crimes to go unaccounted for. Maybe the dog mauled him to death. Who knows? I said it before and I'll say it again. Okay, one more theory just because I have to mention it. Ferris's day was all a dream. No. That trope is cheap and bad. Unless you mean a notorious song, big man, throw that idea right in the trash. And in the winding down of our odyssey, Ferris admits to wanting to finish out school, because like he said in so many other people's senior yearbook quote, life moves quickly so don't piss through it. Fast forward past one of the earliest examples of playing a scene over the closing credits, and you get a golden prize for sticking around for so long. It's over. Go home. While not the first to do it, oh, ho, 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 I just knew I'd catch up with you, boy. <laughs> it definitely paved the way for endless spoofs. It's over. Go home. What are you doing here? The movie's over. Go. And that was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And do I even need to explain? Sure, there are probably some critics like Siskel who didn't like this movie, and that's all well and good. But for me and many others, this movie is one of a kind. Matthew Broderick is Ferris Bueller, and I think he's a really talented and natural actor. Staring directly into the camera for a character to speak directly to the human meat sack sitting in the theater chairs is a technique that is rarely done sparingly and has only a few exceptions in my opinion, with FB holding the top spot. I feel Alan Ruck is overshadowed when people look back on this movie, but he's the glue holding it all together. He adds some much needed humanity and depth to the cast, and his arc is... Tragic. Tragic! The supporting cast is flawless, with Sarah's effortless elegance, Jones playing an outrageous... Dick! And everyone in between. Also, a huge mention to Eddie McClurg, who plays Ed's assistant. I didn't mention her during the review, but she provides some of the funniest quips and character moments of the movie. Well, makes you look like an ass is what he does, Ed. What a little asshole. It's a shame she vanishes during the middle. She probably had to get to her other job. May I help you? I want a fucking car. This movie is as much a love letter to Chicago as the Blues Brothers meets Al Capone and takes you to the famous locations without feeling pandering and cheap. Like at Universal Studios. <laughs> Why should he get to ditch when everybody else has to go? That's the appeal of the movie. We are all Cameron. 
trying to make our way through this nonsensical, unfair world. Yet we all hope to one day be as clever, suave, intelligent, likable, courageous, and confident as Ferris. More adjectives, please. It's the ultimate story of growing up and cutting loose one last time before all semblances of adolescence fades away. The dynamic of these two friends create the ultimate foil to one another, the definitive yin and yang. It's simultaneously an extremely 80s movie while remaining timeless. And as it revs its way towards being 40 years old, it still resonates with audiences old and young, and has been and always will be one of my favorite movies. I'm going to give Ferris Bueller's Day Off Because it is beautiful. The way you did it was absolutely perfect. It's the whole package. That's what she said. Another good one. You're on fire. With something for everyone to love, from Broderick's endless charm, Alan Ruck's relatable angst, to John Hughes's great script and insanely catchy soundtrack. And in a time where things seem increasingly bleak and hopeless, this flick's message speaks louder than ever before. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. I'm Confused Reviews. Thanks for watching. Whoa! You guys are still here? It's over. Go! And watch another one of these damn reviews. They take a long time to make.